what is a pick, what kind of picks are available, looking at the idea of programming a pick and also very much to do with the hardware associated with picks. The old way is to design circuits with multiple components. You can see there that in that example lots and lots of components. I've colour coded them so you can see different ones. There's 12 different integrated circuits which themselves uh, contain lots and lots of transistors built into each IC and then there's transistors, there's diodes and so on along the way. So you would design a board with all these components on it and you can see lots of inputs and lots of outputs so you'd test it all as best you could and that would become your uh, finished product. So the old way we would design a circuit then manufacture PCBs that go with it an alarm clock or whatever you're, whatever you're making you then sell the product and there's two possibilities either you bring out a new uh, improved version in which case people have to buy a new product all over again you start the process all over again or you've made some mistake and you've all seen those recall uh, uh, bulletins where they made some mistake in the design and they've got to start all over again or maybe they found an improved version that you, or a amendment or a faulty component doesn't work properly in that situation there's all kind of problems and you have to start again which is a very very costly business if you've sold half a million alarm clocks to only to find that they don't work and although you spent all the money on all the components you're still stuck with a non-working product there's a, a drive for a, a, a better way so the better way is to say take all those multiple um, components all the transistors and ICs and so on that were on that board squeeze them all into a particular chip that we can program to do the jobs of all these other individual components we can still design them, we can still manufacture, we can still distribute but if anything goes wrong we're not stuck with half a million units in the back shelf unsold because they don't work we can go in and simply update the firmware you, you've had that yourselves probably in, I don't know, in your TV at home click a button to update the firmware on, on your, your television So to do that we're using microcontrollers, this is the some ICs in the form of picks. As you can see there they come in all shapes and sizes, let me just show you them in real life. There they are. So you can get some idea of the scale, they go from these tiny little surface mount devices that's got maybe six pins or eight pins right up to uh, 40 pin and these are all these four are all uh, through hole in other words they've got legs on them to mount if you want to go to even larger ones with over a hundred pins of course you have to then go to uh, surface mount versions so they come in other words in all kinds of uh, shapes and sizes but they all do the same job the only difference is the scale of which they do it the tiny one that you see in the right hand side has only got six pins it's not going to do a lot you can't connect an awful lot of switches and push buttons and lights to only six wires but inside it's doing a similar job but in a smaller scale than the big ones we're going to investigate these quite thoroughly shortly so, what are we actually talking about? Well, these pick chips are, find themselves in lots and lots of kits that, that Merg sell. You'll see there on the left hand side 
the, the national kits that have PIC chips inside them to operate servers, to operate C bus, to do the shuttles, DCC decoders, automatic train controller, that's the shuttle that goes back and forward, the automatic shuttle. The right hand side shows a whole list of uh, pocket money kits that, and it shows the versatility of PIC chips because in that list there, um, the welder, the easy points, the lighthouse, the coach lighting, the timer, the geo flasher, laser totty, steam emulator, all use the exact same chip. They do all kind of different jobs, but they use the exact same chip. The only difference being the program you put inside them. So, what do you mean when we, when we say a pick? A pick is actually a, a brand name from a huge company called Microchip. They manufactured their own range of PIC chips. They also bought over the Arduino uh, the AVR range that make all the Arduino chips. So, the first thing to say that the PIC chip are microcontrollers. So, I thought it might be worth having spend a couple of minutes saying what's the difference between a microcontroller and a microprocessor because they sound very similar. A microprocessor is what you've got right now when you're sitting watching me uh, on your computer. That's the main brains that runs your laptop or your desktop. But it can't do it in its own. As you know, it sits inside a motherboard and it's got all kind of add-ons for graphics and so on. Uh, you have to plug in separate memory uh, slots and all that kind of stuff. It needs a, a lot of ancillary stuff. The microcontroller, you can conceive of that as being uh, already enclosing these components. Needs a bit more explanation, but let's start with that. I think a good, an, I use this as an analogy for picks. This is what what's inside in that black box is meant to be inside your computer. The big CPU there, that's your micro uh, processor. It does all the thinking and adds all the movement. And then you've got on top of that a, a, a block of memory. And that's where you store your the program you're working on. It's either the browser, or it's your spreadsheet, or your graphics program, whatever you're working on is in there. And you've also a small bit of memory that's backed up with a little battery on your, your uh, motherboard. So if you switch off and back on the next day, it still knows what the current day and time is. It knows you've got a UK keyboard or whatever. That's a tiny piece in comparison to the main memory. And then finally you've got the computer's access to the outside world. Input output we call it. It's got v, possibly a VGA port for the video or a DVI or an HDMI output for the video to so go to your monitor. It's got USB sockets for your mouse or your keyboard or memory sticks or whatever. And into those input outputs you can connect a whole multitude of devices. If I now show you the same thing, how similar is that between the computer version, PIC version? It's still got a CPU to do all the thinking. It's still got memory to store your program you're working on, whether it's a shuttle or, or whatever, a flashing LEDs. It's still got a, a block of memory that will store values after you've powered down. For example, if you have the, um, the server phone module and you've set up all the settings for the, the points, you don't want to lose them every time you switch the power off, so you store them in a, a block of memory. And finally, you've also got input-output boards on a PIC chip. So, it looks very similar, but obviously it's a much uh, scaled down operation compared to the uh, motherboard in a 
computer. The input-output ports here could conceivably be figured to, uh, to do monitors. More commonly, it's used to do hardware, and certainly from our point of view, for model railways, we're looking at operating relays, bringing lights off and on, moving servers to operate points and signals, all that kind of stuff. But in essence, you can think of a PIC as a scaled down computer. But because all of these functions are in the one case, it's not called a, a microcomputer. It's called a microcontroller, it's not a microprocessor. What we can do from now on is look at this model and say, that's how it works. What can microchip actually offer us? So, what can we expect of a PIC? Well, firstly, they're very low cost. You can buy them from 50p upwards, even with this, the recent increase in prices you get in eBay and um, Farnell and so on, they're still relatively cheap. The smallest ones can come in at roughly 50 pence a time. And when you think of how much it can do inside that tiny chip, compared to multiple, multiple transistors and diodes and so on, then it's a real steal. It's also very widely available. If you haven't come across picks before, they're everywhere. You've got them in your car, you've got them in your alarm clock, and so on. You've got them in your uh, gas detectors, and all kinds of gadgets. You'll see there that in 2008, they've actually manufactured 6 billion of them. And by 2013, it doubled to 12 billion. I couldn't find a current figure. I searched everywhere to find the total number of sales now, and all I can find is that they sold $5.3 billion worth a couple of years ago. So in other words, you know, they're very widely in use. There's lots of experience behind it, lots of knowledge, and that's why they're so cheap, because they're mass produced. They've also, because they're so widely in use, they've got a large user base. Lots of help is available. The microchip themselves have their own forum. So you can join the forum, ask questions, and get help from other users who've got more experience than you. JAL is just one of the programming languages that's used to program chips. It stands for just another language. It's our own good friend in Wozag here, that chick, who first introduced me to JAL. And then I started writing uh, pocket money kits using JAL and put the JAL code in the forum. And then other people have picked up on it. And now there's a JAL um, special interest group, all thanks to our own friend uh, Chick here. Once again, JAL's got his own help group. So the first one is microchip in general, and the JAL group is specifically on programming using the JAL language. So there's lots of help out there. Not only that, there's extensive application notes. What I mean by that is if you go into Microchip's own website, you'll see that they have downloadable PDFs, how to interface to I2, I squared C, how to interface this sensor or that sensor, how to make it work, for pulse width modulation, all kinds of application notes to help people develop. Because the more help they give to the, the, the user, the more likely they are to use their chips. So they've got a self-interest in helping you to help them. And the other good news is that you can play about with JAL without spending a penny. The software that is used to write programs for PICs are free. There's MPLab, which is the, the large elaborate version, very well, um, lots of functions built in, very elaborate, got a bit of a learning curve, and then there's JAL, which is a simple, uh, uh, simplified version. 
These two are free to download. You can buy commercial versions in, for Pick C, Pick Basic, and so on. But most people are happy to start off in JAL and maybe uh, later go on to doing it in MP Lab, which has got more facilities. So. Without you spend a penny, you can actually start to learn to program. It's only you want to actually program the chips themselves, you've got a cost. The other thing about those chips that I showed you a moment ago is that you can program them relatively easily. But even better, you can reprogram them. In other words, you write a program to flash a LED uh, 10 times a minute and you get it wrong, and it's doing a hundred times a minute by mistake. You don't throw that chip in the bin and get another one. You can reprogram the exact same chip over and over again till you get it right. From memory, I think microchips say you can, uh, they guarantee you can reprogram their chips uh, about a hundred thousand times before it degrades. So even for beginners, a hundred thousand mistakes you know, uh, for 50 pence, I think, is, is, is worth the money. So they're easy to reprogram, but not only that, you can program it in situ. What I mean by that is, you don't program the chip in a programmer, put it into your module, test it, doesn't work right, take it back out, program it again, put it back in again, still not right. You're not putting it out and in, out and in all the time till you get it right. You can leave it in the board and change the program as you go along to get it correct. There, for example, is the Servo 4 module that we sell. And you'll see there I've marked up five pins called the ICSP. Let me just show you again. If I take that away, there's one there. And you can see the five pins here. And all I have to do is get the cable from the programmer, plug it in there, and we're ready to go. I can program that chip while it's still in that module. So if somebody comes along, you'll see, if I turn it the other way around, it says that that's version K. So if you've got an older uh, model you bought, a kit you bought last year, and it says Revs J, you can simply put the cable in it and program the new one in there instead. So it's programmed in situ. It's called ICSP because it's a... It's for programming, it's for serial programming. So you send the data across serially, so it's serial programming, and the IC stands for in circuit. You can program it while it's still in the circuit, while it's still in the module. Which is a, a big benefit, a big, big benefit. Because you can program it and see instantly when you power it up to do what you want it to do. Right, so what kind of picks are there then? I showed you some pictures, but what can we expect to be inside them? What are the main components? I'm only covering some of the uh, most basic ones I'll come across, because I don't have time to look at any more detail. First of all, I said earlier, they come in all shapes and sizes, from 6-pin, either surface mount versions you see there, or the, the through-hole version, you, you plug into an IC socket, right over to Monsters, 144 pins, but you have to solder all these. So if you're handy with a solder man, you can have lots and lots of um, facilities if you're able to solder 144 pins as small as that. There's other methods, obviously. but. Most people, when they start off, are going to use through hole because it's much, much easier to, to, to handle. So that's what they look like, in, but what did, what's inside that tiny case? Well, it, 
let's start off by looking at the, the what we can expect from inside. First of all, how fast do they work? What's the speed? We mentioned earlier there's a CPU built in, which is the, the, the brains that, uh, that does all the decision making and, and uh, pushing stuff about the place, all the data transfers. How fast does that work? Well, that's where it falls down compared to the CPU built into a computer. Computers, as you know, uh, the one you've got, maybe one running at um, 1 gigahertz, 1.8 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, whatever. We're talking in gigahertz, generally speaking, for a modern computer. A PIC chip can be as low as 1 megahertz. More likely, 4 megahertz, 16 megahertz, maybe up to 64 megahertz. Much, much slower. Is that a problem? Not normally, because the CPU inside a computer has to handle lots and lots of different uh, operations, graphic operations and so on, talking to the graphics board, talking to the memory, all kinds of data transfers. For model railways, we don't need huge speed. We're not going to be flashing the lead at one million times a second. If you could, you wouldn't even see a difference, so it wouldn't matter. Most of the things that happen in model railways happen at a much slower pace than the, the hectic activity inside your, your motherboard. So we're talking about in between 1 and, and say 64 megahertz, generally speaking maybe about 16 megahertz. So they're much slower. The memory is different. Inside uh, your computer, you've got one big chunk of memory. So when you decide to go into your browser and you're looking at your internet, it's taking up a chunk of that memory space. And you then decide you want to put that in the background and work on your uh, spreadsheet. You load in Excel, it is another chunk of memory. Not only that, that the spreadsheet you're working on shares the same memory. So you get one big block of memory that's got to store the program you're working on and also the data, the spreadsheet, the letter or whatever it is. So in computers, they, uh, they share it. It's called a von Neumann architecture. Doesn't really matter. Inside PICs, they use what they call Harvard architecture. What that means is you get one block of memory for the program and a different block of memory for the data. So if you're working on um, flashing lights and you want it to run flash 10 times, then the program says it and the bottom bit here is what stores the variables, the count. I flashed it once, I flashed it twice, it knows as the program runs, what has changed. And they're in separate blocks of memory. And thirdly, you've got the EEPROM, which is the the tiny block I showed you earlier that stores its, stores its variables after you switch off. So the memory inside the PIC is in three blocks. The program memory only stays in memory while the program... Uh, oh, sorry stays in memory the whole time, even with the program switched off. Only runs when you power it up. The data memory stores uh, variables as the program runs. So when you switch the power off to that module, they're gone. And the EEPROM is where you store things for the longer term. Things like um, settings for servos and, and such. Right. The other thing that's important for all developers is the number of pins it's got because obviously the number of pins, particularly what they call I.O. pins, input-output pins, that's where the, the chip is going to communicate with the outside world. That's where you attach switches and track detectors and that's where you put on for inputs. That's where you put on LEDs and relays and so on for outputs. So the little six pin I showed you isn't going to do much because it's not got many connections. So it's horses for courses. If all you want to do is flash one LED then you go off with a, a smaller chip with hardly any I.O. pins. 
if you want to control the entire layout, you might be looking at using one of the larger versions. And lastly, inside uh, pick chips, they vary in terms of what they can offer. So the facilities might include, as you see there, ADC, which means analog to digital. You can have slider ports, you can have varying light levels and so on, and convert into use for the program. DACs are the opposite. You give it a digital number and it'll put out an analog value on a pin. Pulse width modulation is ideal for like dimming or getting acceleration and deceleration in locos. And then the bottom list are all to do with a connection to the outside world, communicating with the USB or whatever. So there's lots of um, potential and we've got to pick the right one for the job that we want to do. So let's start with the, the bottom of, of the food chain. This is the smallest one that's still currently sold by Microchip, the 10F200. You'll find that that label at the top there is, is common to the models. There's a 10 series and then there'll be a 14, a 16 series and so on. So everything that you see inside that box is meant to be what's inside that tiny little chip. It's only a six pin chip here. The CPU runs at four megahertz maximum. You can make it run slower if you wanted to, but it runs at four megahertz maximum. And as you can see, you can't change it from the outside world. It's internally calibrated, so it's plus or minus 1%, which isn't good enough for data communications, which has to be spot on, but it's good enough for you know, logic uh, purposes and switching leads and so on. So the, the oscillator for that CPU is built in. You can't change it. It's got a timer that's, that we won't cover today, but... And then we've got two blocks of memory just. One for the program, which is called flash memory, and one for the variables you use as the program runs. The figures that are in dark red are talking about the size. You've only 256 bytes of program. And if that sounds not much, it's because it's not much. And the data memory, similarly, can only hold 16 bytes of variable. And on the right hand side here, they've got the I.O., the input, output. There are four pins out of the six that are available to the outside world. That's where you can connect switches and LEDs and so on. And as we go along, you'll see that same outline, but it'll get bigger and better as you go to, to larger um, chips. But that's the smallest chip you can get. Doesn't do a lot because I, I tried this. The... The traffic light kit we've got, I cut it down to only flash one set of lights, one red, amber, green, rather than two way. And it took 661 bytes. And if you flick back, that chip only can handle 256. It can't, we couldn't even store that in it. Even the dual flasher is too big to fit in. So other, other Kits like the welder, the lighthouse, and so on. I've got no chance of sitting inside that um, that chip. So it's handy for some um, logic purposes. If that input goes high and that one goes high and that one goes low, that's when we switch the output. That kind of stuff. So we can use it for basic to replace multiple uh, logic chips, but not much else. So we have to go a bit bigger. And that's what we do. This is the chip that I've used extensively in the pocket money kits. That's where your, your laser detector comes from and the easy points and so on. Now when you see something in red, that's an upgrade. Previously they ran at 4 megahertz, we're now up to 20 megahertz. Now instead of 256 bytes, we've got 1k, a thousand bytes, so it's four times, the program can be four times bigger. 
the data memory which stores the variables again is um, enlarged and we've got a new box here another block of memory now for the first time we've brought in this EEPROM the block of memory that holds values when the power goes down like you, like you store phone numbers on your phone for example but in our case it could be for storing server 4 variables and a new block here called ADC for the first time this chip can handle analog inputs again measure light levels can handle um, as you turn this a pot or pull a slider up and down and because it's got more pins it's, we've gone up to eight pins it means that we're allowed to have six different IOs it's worth mentioning folks at this point in time you'll see I've got an arrow that points in both directions it means that any one of those six can be an input or an output they're not uh, pre-configured if you switch on it assumes they're all inputs just by default but you can explicitly say by the way I want pin 2 to be an output and I want pin 5 to be an output so you can and then later on you can say no I want pin 5 to be an input now so you're able to control what any of those six pins do in the real world do they connect to switches or do they connect to LEDs or, or whatever The 675, very ubiquitous, you'll find lots and lots of examples of that if you, if you Google um, on PICS. And it's, it's much bigger, so it can handle the traffic lights, it can handle the, the dual flasher, the welder, the lighthouse and so on. And because it's got, that's only, only using outputs, there's no inputs there. You switch the power on, the traffic lights start going. You switch the power on and the welder emulation starts going and so on. There's no inputs but you can have, you can have an analog inputs now. So the laser totty we're measuring the, the uh, intensity of, of the laser beam to see whether it's broken or not as a train passes. We're measuring light levels in other words. The automatic coach lighting the same thing we're bouncing lights off the track and then we're seeing whether the the light has changed the light level has changed and then we can then bring on the coach lighting so we're making use of the analog to digital facility that's built into that chip and the same with the ambient light totty it doesn't have to be light it could be any kind of input in fact the easy points uh, uses little trimmers, little potentiometers that you tweak to, to set the speed of the, of the point and also the two um, end points of the servo to move the point back and forward. So we, here's examples where we've taken advantage of both the output facilities but also analogue input facilities provided by the 675. It's quite uh, long in the tooth now and Fairly recently, they brought out another one called the 18313. It's also 8 pin. In fact, it's 8 pin compatible. You can plug that into the same uh, module as the 675 earlier. But you'll see lots of red on that one because it brings in features that uh, are new. But we'll start with the CPU. 675 ran at 20 megahertz, 32. So it runs a lot faster. It's got three times the amount of memory of the 675. An awful lot more memory uh, for, for storing variables and more memory for storing variables when the power is switched off. Still the same 6 IOs because it's only, still only an 8-pin chip. But it's, it's got 5 ADCs now. 5 of those pins can, can be configured as having analog inputs rather than digital inputs. We've got a new box in red here called a DAC. For the first time we can have uh, variable DC voltage outputs from a PIC. And for the first time we brought in PWM where we can pulse with modulate an output using the internal code uh, built into the chip itself. 
And down the bottom you'll see in red here, we've got three interfaces to the outside world now. The I squared C, SPI, which is a serial uh, interface, and the UART, which you probably know better as the, the 232, RS232 interface. So it provides a, a lot more facilities than the 675 in the same 8-pin um, configuration. More complex to program because it's got all these extra facilities. The PWM can be used for, as I said before, uh, speeding up and slowing down motors. You can accelerate and decelerate trains. You can dim LEDs. You can make them um, ramp up, ramp down, ramp up, ramp down, rather than just switching off and on. It's got a DAC. Not very good. It's only what they call a 5-bit DAC. It can only put out 32 different DC values. So it'll go between nothing and 5, but in 32 steps just. So it's a kind of... You could, you could use it for acceleration and deceleration. It's most commonly used for basic signal generation or ADC calibration. So if you want to know whether your analog is working properly, you send out the digital at one end, put it back in at the analog end and check that you get what you thought you'd get. Or you can use the pick to give you reference voltages. If you want to know whether something works at uh, 3.2 volts, set the DAC up to give you 3.2 volts as an output and you can check whether it works. The other <coughs> interface that they uh, provided is the UART, the serial port. That's what's used to program the Servo 4. Right now the Servo 4 is programmed either but you saw me earlier plugging in the cable uh, into this, plugging in a, a serial cable. But that meant I had to connect it to a, a PC and use software to set up a servo. Or I had to buy a special setting box. With this new facility that the, the 18313 has got, we could have a little module that you plug into the servo 4 and have an LCD screen and a couple of buttons and you can set it all up and see what you've got as a, as a digital readout without the servo setting box or without a computer. For example, the I2C uh, is what I use for the EasyBus system, but it's also available, obviously, uh, in the, the the PIC versions. I2C is especially valuable because you can connect multiple devices into that that chip from now on. You can do temperature sensing. You can do distance sensing. I should mention, by the way, you don't have to write all this down ever because it's, it's re getting recorded and it'll be available. You can connect OLED screens. Let me just uh, show you some of these. Right. There's a tiny little OLED screen. And the pins here are power and the I squared C. There's a radar one that measures distance from that little component there. And again, the output is I squared C. There's a real time clock. You just put a 2032 uh, battery in there and the circuits underneath will maintain the clock. So you can switch off and it'll know the exact time when you switch back on. Very similar to what you find inside a, a PC. This one here is an accelerometer. It does tilt and acceleration. That's what I used to experiment with initially for the automatic coach lighting. So any changes in uh, either tilt or movement, any change of movement would bring on uh, an output from here.
also there's things like touch screens, there's uh, audio players and so on. But the, the, the beauty of that is you don't have to pick one or the other. You can have them all onto that same two pins of the I squared C. So you could use the, the touch to set up what you want by pressing buttons. It could be measuring distance and temperature and putting the, the answers out on the OLED screen. And it'd all be connected up through the same two pins, the I squared C pins. In fact, connect the audio as well, so if something goes wrong, you get, you get an audio warning. So there's the ability to have I square C in that chip opens up a whole new range of possibilities for developers and hobbyists. Right, that was the 18313. It's got a big brother, the 18323, which is similar except it's got 14 pins. As you can see, there's nothing in red there really, because nothing's changed. It's still got the same memory, the same CPU and so on. The only thing that's changed is that it's got more outputs now, because they've gone from an 8-pin to a 14-pin. So you'll see an extra block of 6 pins there. It's got 12 pins that you can connect to the outside world. When you get to that kind of numbers, we start calling them ports. The first six is called port A. Sometimes it's a, a bunch of eight that's called port A. In this case, the first six are port A. Second lot, for some unknown reason, are called port C rather than port B. So it's got all the same facilities as the one I mentioned earlier, but extra pins for the outside world. That would be replacing the, uh, the the 676 pick we've used up till now for things like the um, the random lights and so on. The um, what else? The se sequencer, that kind of thing. They use the 676 just now. The future version will use the 323 probably. There's um, a project we have um, using a PIC to control one of our exhibits we take to shows. The red dots you see there are the pins that are used for the ICSP. That's the ones we use to program the chip. And the blue dots you see there are all inputs coming from uh, track sensors. Uh, so the blue dots are the track sensors and the other dots that you see that, that are clear, like the gate, the signal, the points, the crane and so on, are all uh, outputs. Forward and reverse there are used to actually control the local itself to make it go forward and backwards as it jumps back and forth across the track. So we've organised that so we can plug in the the programmer into that chip while it's still in use. We can quickly change things and see the difference. And if it's more happy with it all, we simply unplug the ICSP um, plug. There's the current use of the Shuttle Plus, the newest uh, kit that I'm looking at just now. And it's been written with the uh, the one eight three two three, the fourteen pin version. Everything's in use. Every pin's used. The top two are for the power. And then <clears throat> you'll see little arrows point out the way. That's outputs, going to relays or going to LEDs. <clears throat> the arrows that point in the way are coming from various uh, track detectors, or maybe a port. And then we come to the, the granddaddy uh, of pick chips that are through hole. 40 pin. You can get bigger, more pins, but of course by that time, as I showed you earlier, you're into uh, surface mount versions. It's just more of the same. 
It's got three PWMs this time. It runs at 64 megahertz. It's the top of the range for for that uh, for that range. Much more memory for programs. Much more memory for the data. Much more memory of EEPROM. And of course, because it's got 40 pins, we've got a lot more outputs. So there's four banks of eight and one bank of four. So in other words, four eights are 32, 36 of the pins uh, can be configured to connect to the outside world, to our model railway in other words. One big change for this one is you'll see there that the ADC says 32 which means that almost all of these output ports, if you wanted to, could be made ADC. Whereas previously, ADC pins it had to be that pin, that pin and that pin. I told you in advance what pin it had to be. This way you can de decide which pin you want to, or as many as you want, up to 32. So you can have loads and loads and loads of different sensors for measuring temperatures here, there and everywhere, voltages here, there and everywhere, light levels here, there and everywhere. Whatever suits your needs. This crater fork is much more flexible. And that's us looking at probably the, the top of the range for uh, through hole chips. So I thought it'd be worthwhile doing a quick uh, comparison between an Arduino Nano, which is really a, an Atmega 328 chip, compared and the, the, the bigger Mega and the biggest uh, of the PIX. So you can see the Mega beats the, the PIC in terms of the flash memory and in size of EEPROM and the number of IOs. But again, it's, it's horses for courses, depends what you, you, you feel you, you want to use for what particular purpose. The beauty of the little tiny six pin picks is they are tiny. And as long as you can solder uh, picks, the SMD chips rather, then there's no reason why you can't have very small modules inside your locals or inside your trucks or whatever. Right, how do we know about all these specifications? Well, you probably heard the term RTFM. Being Sunday, I'll say what that means is read the flipping manual. Doesn't quite mean that, but that's near enough. In our case, we would call it RTFDS, read the flipping data sheet. If I'm not sure what a chip can do, Go onto the microchip website, download the PDF, and it'll tell you. It comes with a, um, a warning that the 8, uh, 8313, which is the smallest of the, the, the three I showed you, runs to 471 pages, which is much more data than you're ever going to want to know. However, was a shortcut because early on you get a page like you see here. This gives you a, a breakdown of the main components inside that chip. So I've just blown them up here so you can read it a bit better on the screen. It tells you here that it runs at 32 megahertz clock maximum. It tells you down here how much memory they can handle what's built into it. This one here tells you the, the operating voltage. You'll see it comes in two versions. It comes with a, a version that will run designed for working at 3.3 volts essentially. Lots of modern interface devices, sensors and so on, are designed to run at 3.3 volts. So you can get a chip a version of this chip that runs uh, at up to 3.6 and that means you can interface all the modules together without having to do any voltage translations between them or you can buy the straightforward version that runs at 5 volts and it tells you down the bottom here 
what it can communicate with. It's got a 232 port, SPI and I2C. So without reading the whole 471 pages guys, you can simply look at the, the first few pages and it'll tell you what that chip is capable of. Later on, I'll tell you how to do it, but that tells you what it can do, plus more. I've only covered some of them, as you can see. Another page does that. It tells you what pins do what. So the top one is for the 313, the 8-pin version. The bottom one is for the 14-pin version. And you'll see I've added the red arrow there to say, look, pin 13 there has got more than one job. It can be used as a, a proper input-output pin, but it can also be used for, um, I, for the programming, ICSP. Moving on. Further down, you'll find, if you need it, much more detail. That's only a part of a page. Only part of a page. But that's looking at RA0, which is the pin that this uh, had over here. What can that do, really? We can do lots of things, depending on how you want to use it. And it tells you there. I've only marked in red some of them. It could be a general purpose I.O. In other words, it could handle switches if you wanted. Push buttons and so on. Or it could handle outputs to, to relays and LEDs. Or it could be uh, an input channel for potentiometers and light levels and so on. Or it could be an, an analog out. Or it could simply be uh, handling data for the ICSP for programming. Clearly it doesn't do them all at the same time and that's where the programming language comes in. You can decide what that pin's going to be used for. That just says, I can do any of these. Tell me what you want me to do. And the programmer decides, I want to use that for an LED or whatever. So the first... Um, handful of pages in any of those data sheets tells you the main things you want to know as a beginner. If you want to know more, there's a page on the browser of Microchip where you can type in what you want. I want to have 20 pins. I want it to have four, at least four ADC. I want it to work at that particular voltage. And you put in all the parameters of what you want. And it'll tell you what chips are available that cover that. So you can either, as a beginner, just pinch somebody else's uh, circuit. Or if you're trying to develop something yourself, you can go onto that page and tell it what your needs are. And it'll say the following 10 picks or 20 picks will cover what you want. Usually they cover that and more. If you say, I want to have at least three analog inputs, it'll probably tell you a whole bunch that have four and ten and so on. As you see there, there's 700, currently, and I looked up yesterday, there were 779 different picks that make the chip sell. Right, so you have a bit of waiting to do to get what you want if you're a, a new developer. But if you're a beginner, you're probably best just sticking to what other people have used in the past because you know it works. Right, we'll stop soon. I just want to cover a couple of issues about how do you use chips. Well, pick chips, the very smallest one I showed you didn't give you the option. You had a built-in oscillator and that was it. Every other one since then gives you the option to have an internal, you see at the end there, just use the one that's already built in. But it's got a degree of error. Nothing that would trouble you. I mean, if uh, you're working at 4 megahertz and you're out by 1% and you're trying to flash a LED, you won't tell a difference of a 1% difference in, 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 in speed 
or one percent difference in light level or whatever. It doesn't matter. But if you're working for things like um, communications, where the two modules have to speak at this and listen at the exact same rate, you want them to be both to be spot on frequency wise. Then you have the option to add on either a, re a resonator or a crystal. A externally, of course. So that you have that option before you even start. Next question is, how tolerant is a pick? What happens if, if I get one that says it will handle up to 5.5 volts for toxic? What if I put in 6 volts? Because that's handy, that's just 2, 3 volt batteries. Does that still work? No. Right. When it tells you the maximum voltage, it means the maximum voltage. If you, if you go over by a large amount, then it's just going to blow the chip. If it's by a small amount, it might not blow it, it'll just keep on degrading it till it, till it fails. So you should never go over voltage. Next question, can I go under voltage? No. <laughs> uh, you don't have much margin there because if it tells you I'm meant to work from say 3 volts onwards, it means that if you want stability, you need to put in at least 3 volts to, to power that chip. Any less than that, then it might drop out, it might stop working. Uh, some people have seen that in, in, in the real world, they built say the Servo 4 and all the points keep going ding 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 and what's happening is that there's a problem with their, their power supply, it's not stable when it tries to draw power to move the servos, the voltage drops. The voltage drops so much that the chip just drops out. When the chip drops out, the current comes back, uh, goes down, the voltage comes back up and it cuts back in again. And so on, in, out, in, out. And that's what's causing the continual movement. So it's not tolerant to big changes in voltage compared to its voltage range. It's also can be prone to uh, spikes and drops. What I mean by that is that if you have a, a, a 5 volt supply, make sure it's properly regulated. If it's got lots of transient little spikes in it, then it might take you over the, the, the value. Or you might have drops in the voltage which te temporarily drop it out and, and the pick resets. So that's well, you, the reason why we've got smoothing capacitors in, on the circuits. So that's why I've got little 100 nanofarads across the, 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 the chip itself. And the biggest one of all is the next one. You have the ability, as I mentioned earlier, to make a pin either an input or an output. Don't mix them up. If you said something's an input by mistake and you put a lead across it, no damage. If you said something should be an output and you put a switch across it instead of a lead and you throw the switch, then you get 5 volts in the pin, 0 volts also in the pin, maximum current, maximum smoke. So it's, that's why you'll see that well, a lot of our designs we put at the top of the, the, the code a little description of what pins do, what they, where they go. I'm often asked also about static, you know, because if you're handling CMOS chips, for example, you're meant to earth yourself, wear earth straps, you know, stand in a bucket of water, all that kind of stuff, right, to prevent that static discharge. I have to say, although we recommend still doing that anti-static activities, I've been handling PIC chips for Merg for many, many years now. I've bought them in bulk from China and I've provided from memory something like 13,000 kits for Merg. And all that time, I can honestly, I've never destroyed one by, by static. So it's a caution you put in, but in practice I've never had any problems with it. On the other hand, I don't tend to wear nylon underwear, so that's another story. 
Um, the most common uh, problem is pins breaking or bending. We're we'll talking about usage, that is. That's why it's handy to have in serial programming because if you're always plugging and unplugging, metal fatigue comes in and you can actually break a pin off or it'll bend under. Instead of going into the socket, it bends under and doesn't make contact. So that's some simple uh, usage issues before we get to any, anywhere else. So we've got to the point, we've looked at all these uh, chips, what facilities they've got, and we're not going to cover what to put in as contents, but how do we get a program, once we've written it, into a, a PIC chip? Well, the most common way is to, we start off with instructions. We write the program. It doesn't matter what the program is. That one there is for the, uh, the multi-flasher. If you put in various wire links, you get a welding pattern. Otherwise, you get a tram pattern or a fluorescent tube and so on. We don't need to go through the code. That's the function of the, the JAL group. I should say that a lot of keep saying that if people have a, a, a question about JAL, um, they want to raise any of the general sessions we have, we're not going to say leave it to, to the JAL group, but in general, if you want to learn about programming, that's the, the, the way to go. So we start off, we assume we've written the program, we've written it in a language called JAL, and it does what we want it to do, or so we think. So how do we get that from there? into the actual chip itself. We have written that on the screen in a computer program. In the same way you would type it in, say, in Word for Windows or something, you type it in as a piece of text. And it's got to get from that into the language that the computer, uh, the, uh, the chip understands. So what it does, it converts it. The software converts it into a whole string of ones and nothings to send to the pick chip. To make it a bit easier to read, they're assembled together as hex files. We covered that in the Electronics 2 course, but essentially it's a long string of nothings and ones that are going to end up inside the memory of the pick chip itself. So we write it, we call it david.jal, merg.jal, and then when we com compile it as a call it, we'll end up with something called david.hex or merg.hex. And that's the, the actual piece that we want to put into the chip itself. How do we do that? Well, we need hardware and software. The hardware is just the interface. You saw me earlier on plugging a, a, a plug into the servo 4. I didn't show you the other end of that bit of wire. It's a bit of hardware. It's called a, a PIC programmer. And the most common ones are made. You can get them um, from eBay. But the, one, the most common ones that are made by microchip themselves are called the PIC kit 1, 2, 3 and 4. Obviously, the 4 is the latest one of that series. So you need the hardware, something that connects the computer to the chip itself. And once you've done that, you need the software, because you've got to get all these ones and nothings that are sitting in the computer somewhere, in that hex file, from there into the actual chip. So the programmer is one thing, and the editor is what you, you uh, create with. There's Farnell selling the latest uh, pick kit 4 chip uh, uh, programmer. Hefty piece of cost. You can buy clones of it. In other words, versions made in China but not made by microchip themselves, but largely function the same. There's always a caveat. Through experience of, of running this course, I've had lots of people have, have gone out and bought one of these. And but 90% of the time, it's worked. It does exactly the same as the, the, the much more expensive version. Sometimes people get one and it doesn't work. That's a, a gamble you take. If a gamble pays off, you save yourself 40 odd quid. There's an even cheaper one. Looks the exact same as, as the, the regular one. What, what do they look like? Let's switch camera. 
Right. There's a pick kit three. There's a pick kit two. That end comes to here. And that's what we plug in to the ICSP, you remember, on here. So I've now connected this to the, the chip itself. And the other end here is just the USB port that will plug into the computer. As simple as that. So if we design any fresh board, all we need to do is make sure that it's got pins on it that, that will allow us to program. And I'll show you that a little bit later. Right. So that's what's happening. You write your program in the, the, the JAL language inside the computer, like a bit of text. You convert it into a whole pile of nothings and ones. You plug in that pick kit into the USB port and it comes along here and the other end goes into the pick chip you want to program. So you can do that for two purposes. I said earlier on you might want to update the module. So you put in a fresh one to overwrite the existing contents or you might be writing your own program, creating something from fresh. But they both use the exact same method you see there. So that takes me on to this next uh, slide, which is looking at which is looking at the uh, surface mount. Because there's one thing soldering a tiny chip in, how do you program it? Well, obviously that's not to scale. I couldn't find mine, but essentially it's a little clamp that you put in the surface mount. You can see the tiny little fingers there. You put it in and, and down it goes and it's clamped. And the other end is a normal uh, set of pins. So you can program it in there and then unclamp it and solder it onto your PCB. If you think you're going to be in a position where you might want to be um, plugging and unplugging a surface mount, then you can use, again, if I could, an adapter board. You can almost just see it. So one end, you can, you can see that the uh, where you would solder it in that side. Yep. And then you put in your header pins through those holes there, and you've got yourself basically a plug-in pick, but built from a surface mount. Which you might want to be using if uh, you're developing. And then the final one would be using the... Uh, this program, this sold on that straight onto a PCB that you've designed. So I've shown an 8 pin on the right hand side, but you'll see I've got whatever that is, you know, 28 pin or whatever version there. They come in different sizes, obviously, depending on what you're trying to uh, program. Right. Just to um, look at the spec once more, you'll see there the top one is looking at the 675. And below it is the, the, the more modern version, the 18313. Just to clarify, because it can be a bit confusing, the pins on the older version for 8 pins, you'll see it says GP, which means general purpose. General purpose meaning it could be input, it could be output, or it could even be ICSP. Depends what you want. The bottom one uses a more modern method, uh, which calls it by the, the, the number. So it'll be RA1, RA2, or it could be RB1, 2, depending on which bank of ones you're using. They've all got what they call a master clear. And what that means is the bar you see above it means if you want to restart the, the pick chip for any reason, halfway through what it's doing, you just bring that pin down to zero volts 
and it'll go back to the beginning of its program and start again. Not commonly used, so quite often you ignore that and use it as an IO pin. That's what the master clear part means. It's also used for when you're programming the chip, because most of them use uh, high voltage programming. What you do is you put a higher voltage in that pin, or at least the pick kit does it for you, to allow you to program. The other reason I put that up there is I used to have confusion myself about it would be handy if it said plus 5 volts, but it doesn't, it says VDD. It would be handy if it says 0 volts, but it doesn't, it says VSS. How do you remember? Is VSS, is that 5 volts or is that 0 volts? How I remember it is that the VSS, the S and the D means source and drain. Current, the electrons flow from negative to positive. Yep. They go from negative to positive, which means that the source of electrons is a zero volts. And then they attract up to the top to the five volts. So the source is zero volts. It's the source of electrons. That's how I remember it. So if you see a circuit diagram, it says take that pin to VSS. It means take it to zero volts. If you see a, a circuit diagram, it says take this pin or this uh, component to VDD. It means take it up to the five volts. So that's some of the hardware issues. The question earlier on was, do we always have to provide power to the chip? Yes, because it's got electronic components inside for logic, for decision making, for timing, for the oscillator. It has to be constantly powered to actually work. So you've lost two pins right away before you even start. So an eight pin only gives you six IO maximum. The, the uh, purple pins there are the ICSP that, that particular chip, 8 pin chip uses. VPP, that's the same as the master clear, that's where you, you raise the voltage high and that's how the pick knows it's time to program. The clock just says, here's the, the speed at which I'm sending you, it's for synchronization. Here's another bit of data, here's another nothing, here's another one and so on. And then the data itself is the nothings and ones that come in. So the stream of data comes in the data line and it's sent through in, in uh, one piece at a time from the clock itself. So you need those three. You only need those three for programming. Once you've programmed, you don't need to use those lines for ICSP anymore. You can use them for ordinary input-output. That's why you end up back with 6IO. Now, it's common also to put 100 nanofarad as close to the, the, the 5 volts and 0 volts of the chip as possible. You remember I said that the, uh, you don't want to have little transients that might affect the operation of the chip. So its job is to be a, a, high, a high filter. So high frequency glitches get shunted across that 100 nanofarad rather than appearing at the, the two pins of the pick itself. You might go off with leaving it, always put them in. Always put them in because uh, you definitely guarantee more stability and it costs a penny for the, for the extra capacitor. You can use a, a pull-up resistor on the VPP or you can decide just to uh, write your code to tell it don't use that for programming, use it as an I.O. So that's the basic, if you don't want to uh, unplug anything and leave the ICSP connected, you've got three possible input-output pins. Like that. There's the programmer, the, the cable that goes between the programmer, which is the pick kit uh, programmer, and the chip itself. It's got five connections as you would expect, there's a three purple ones which are used for the programming and of course the five volts and the zero volts make up the, the five pins. You have, to power, you have to power the chip while you're programming it and the power comes from the, uh, or can come from the pick kit programmer. 
Right, I make up tiny little uh, test bores like that. I can, I can show you one, yeah here's one here. Down that side you can see the five pins of the ICSP. Luckily Merg has arranged them to be staggered as a gap in the middle. So you, you'll see if I show you this, I've put a cocktail stick there. So there's no way I can plug it in the wrong way around by mistake. It's got to go in the correct way with the two and the two. And that's it, ready to go. That, this kitchen here is for, the, is for power. I can connect anything I want onto those three output, output pins. I can make them inputs or outputs. I've got myself a little demo board for, for, just for practice. Or what I, I do more commonly is I have got that, which is what's called a ZIF socket. You put the, the, the uh, chip in there, push down the lever and it's held firmly. And I can now put that cable, the ICSP cable, into there. That's what I use to program all the all the pocket money kits, because it's not only a programmer; it doubles up as a little uh, development board. Because I've put some L, uh, LEDs on it, I've put um, a push button, and I've put a switch on it, and I've taken out all the pins to the side, and I can then use jumpers between you know, uh, GP1 for talking so it could go to that LED, and I can do. Simple test to see if everything works. Just put 12 volts in the top here. So it's, it's what I use for programming and it also doubles up as a, a miniature uh, development board. There's the same thing except it's the 14 pin version. And there's me connected up one of the, the leads. I've connected A0 to one of, the, one of the LEDs. In case anybody asks, that uh, crock clip there is to allow me to put my voltmeter on it. I don't want to take any other readings. The same, I have to hold it on. So that's what I use. And if you want to develop something that's bigger than just what's allowable on this board here, you can use one of these boards. You can then plug in transistors and relays or whatever you want and then bridge across from there onto the various pins here. So if you're doing up prototypes, I find that a very handy way to allow me to do it. There are other options. We could go down the line of having proper development boards, project boards. You can buy them, the one you see there. Well, it's got on it push buttons, it's got LEDs, you know, it's got uh, some um, little trimmers. It's fairly comprehensive. It's got an LCD for, for uh, readouts, but it's expensive. Whether you want to go to that kind of cost is up to you. So that's one way to go about it. You can create your own PCBs. The benefit of that is it does exactly what you want in the tin, but it's complicated. It's, it's fussy. You've got to either have some sort of router to, to uh, drill out the, the uh, unwanted copper, or you've got to etch it. I've got some pictures here of ones we made earlier. This is one uh, made by Chick for 
a USB LCD, a one-off, and that was done uh, a few years ago. If you want to really go back in time, there's this one here, which is one I did way back in 1986, something like that. Uh, for the made for the the Lynx computer, it was a speech module for the Lynx computer, and again that was etched as a one-off. Superseded now, by, of course, by the, the, the proper um, audio boards, but that was an early version using uh, phenoms. That was the Paris Computer Show in 1986 or 87, can't remember, right? as an add-on to the Lynx computer. So that was handy for, for, for one-offs. So, we have development boards you can buy ready-made. You can make your own. Or you can just use strip board, which is very cheap. Chip piece of strip board that costs, I think it's 25 pence. Fairly easy to use, a bit limited, but great for one offs and development. The pocket money kits that we have, most of them began life as strip board versions. But for experimentation and trying stuff yourself, the strip board is a very, very handy way of making up a project board. Another option is to use an existing board that's designed for something else and turn it to your use. There's the Kana 8 board, which I've got. Uh, yeah. It comes as a. a oh. Can't do it that way. It's got a large pick on it. It's got a voltage regulator. And it's got three strips of I.O. there. So, it's already built. You just, have, you just have to buy that PCB out of the kit locker and use it for your own purposes. You've now got, you know, whatever that is, 8, 16, but 20 odd I.O. pins you can use. So it's it's cheap to buy, it's only, you don't have to make your own PCB, just use one that already exists. You don't have much to alter. Or the uh, the JAL interest group uh, can sell you a bare PCB like that to make your own as, a, as an experiments board. Or you can use that, which is the the um, the shuttle PCB. Don't use it for shuttle. It's got a relay on it. It's got two trimmers on it. It's got a couple of leads on it. It's got everything you need. It's got lots of pins down the left and right hand side. You can use that for any purpose you want. I said earlier, the, the big benefit of picks is they're versatile. The code inside that pick runs a shuttle. It can be used for anything else instead. It's only your imagination of what you want to put in there. So it's a very good way to get started. Now, once you've got beyond the stage of just building an existing kit and you want to experiment, buy one of these uh, three different boards uh, as a starting point to play around yourself. If you want to, you can design a PCB nowadays. They're, uh, fairly uh, cheap, relatively speaking. But that's one that uh, Keith was involved in for the automatic uh, coach lighting. Rather than using strip board, we used a, a PCB. And you can see on, on the right hand side here, the scope are shrinking that further. There's wasted uh, space there. We could push it up and probably get it down to about two thirds that size. And that's small enough if you're prepared to do uh, surface mount soldering, so you can the bomb's your oyster right so that's uh, I wanted to look not so much, at, well, I've called it pick programming, but what are the basics of it, we're not looking at code itself here 
And I want to compare it again with uh, an application you've got on your computer. You've got a word processor. The first thing you do is create a blank document. You open up one. Call it whatever you like, give it a name, and then you edit the contents. You know, Dear Mum broke sent a fiver. You know, and once you've done that, you do a spell check. Just to make sure you know, it sounds logical. If anything's gone wrong, you can amend it, add to it, change any mistakes and so on. And then if you're finally finished, you can save that document. So it's sitting in your hard disk and then you can publish it. Uh, you know, print it out or send it as an email or whatever. So that's the process for word processing. It's identical when we want to do it with um, JAL. We still create a document, we still edit it. This time we syntax check it. Syntax checking just means does it fit in with the language that JAL expects? So if you say uh, the word add these two together, no, don't say add A and B. You need to say A plus B. That's what it expects to be. So it would find a mistake in what you've done. In terms of syntax, it won't find mistakes that are logic mistakes. If you meant to say add them together and you put in a minus sign, that's still a valid syntax. It doesn't solve all your problems, but it'll find lots of errors for you. And you can go back and re-edit it and save it. And this time, when we say publish it, we're going to create a hex file that we save it as to use to program. So create, check it, and then use it. Now, I know that the JAL group spend a lot of time looking at what happens inside the chip. The good news is we don't need to know all of that. That's what to expect is the main functions inside one of the PIC chips. You can forget all that, you'd be glad to hear. You don't need to know how it all works deep in detail inside. How confusing is that? That's us looking at the actual machine code that the, the, uh, the computer expects to receive. What the heck's that about? Right? Good news is you don't need to know that how all that works. Because you've got a thing called includes. What that simply means is if you include 16F18313 it says my program now knows how all that works internally. You don't need to tell me all the ins and outs. I know how it all works internally. Thank goodness for that. It takes away all the mysteries. You know, you forget it from now on. And then if you include other things. In other words, the other includes now are things that people have pre-written to save you writing them. So if you want to have delays, you want to flash a LED on for one second, off for a second, put it on, delay for a second, put it off, delay for a second, put it on. You want to have control over the delays in between activities. Don't need to write that from scratch. It's been done already. Just include somebody else's work. That's what the include means. So when you come to compile time, you write your own and it adds in all the bits you need. Same with random numbers and a whole pile of other includes. All you need to know for an include is look at the, the first few lines of the include. Have a look at it and it tells you how to use it. For example, there's a delay and it tells you. If you want to delay for short amounts, just say the words delay 8 microseconds. If you want long delays, use the bottom ones. So let's take the very last one. If you want to have a one second delay between putting the lights off and on, we simply say 10 lots of 100 milliseconds, that's a second. So how to use it is, your program is say delay that, and in the brackets you put in 10. If you want a two second delay, you put in 20. So all you need to know is how to use the include. You don't need to know how it works. All you need to know is how to call it up. There's one, the 
the random lights kit that I've got, as you know, will bring off and on lights on your layout at random. So we need to have to be able to get the program to use a random function. Good news is, it's already written. You just say include random and it'll do it for you. And once again, open up the random include, have a look and it tells you. If you want to use the function random byte, you get an 8-bit number. If you want to roll a dice, you say function dice and it returns a number between 1 and 6. And the beauty of that is I wanted 10, didn't want 6. So I went in and I rewrote it to do 10. And I saved it as random 10 instead of dice. It's, it's as easy as that. I got another one which was a keypad and I already had a, a 3x3 keypad. I went in and changed it to 4x4 keypad and saved it as that. And other folk can now use that include. It saves them re rewriting from... No point in uh, reinventing the wheel. The, the whole idea of includes is to make life easier for you. You can include lots of pre-written stuff other folk have written and mainly you can forget about how all the, the uh, processor itself works internally. That's what the uh, editor looks like. I only put that up there just to remind you that what I do, the bits in green are comments. Just descriptions, they're not actually used, they're not part of the program. But I always start with that chunk there and I remind myself what pin goes to where. That pin there is going to a LED. That pin there is going to a wire link. So, so is that other one over there going to a wire link. And that reminds me. And the, the bigger the chip, if you had a 40 pin chip, it's almost essential to have some sort of chart that tells you what pins do, otherwise you forget them along the way. But we're not going to look at uh, programming itself apart from that hardware aspect of it. Because the whole idea of a, a PIC is to interface to the real world. So you're better starting off by describing how the real world actually connects to the various pins of the PIC. The other beauty of the, the compiler, the editor inside JAL um, is if you make a mistake, it tells you what line it's on. How good is that? And it'll highlight the line. That, that's, that line 32 is wrong. What, it might have worked out what's wrong with it. In that case it has. Other times it'll just say it didn't understand that line. But at least you know where your errors are. You can get a bit lazy to be honest because you just say, I'll write it and see what happens and I'll go and correct all the mistakes. Not the best practice but I know it happens. So how handy is that? We've got includes to save you writing it and the editor even tells you the mistakes. And that's what the interface, there's two bits of software, the one that actually creates the hex file and one that writes it to the chip itself. So you plug in the chip into either my um, one of my test boards, plug in the cable, run this program and it, up here it tells you, it detects what chip it is, how handy is that, it even tells you what you've got connected. And then you go up and say, uh, as, as it get contents already, you can do a blank check. Yeah, is it a virgin file now been written to before? Or do you want to overwrite it with something else? And then you can load in whatever file you want. Here, here comes david.hex. And then hit the right button and that's it. It writes it to the pick chip. And very handily, it also verifies. What that means is, it goes from your computer into the pick chip. The computer then reads it back off the PIC chip and says, here's my original, here's what I've read from the chip, are they the same? Yes. If so, it's programmed correctly, there'll be no glitches. So it's holding your hand along the way. I just wanted now to do a quick review of um, how we can use it in practice and how we have used it in practice. Before we get to that, there's some things we've got to think about. There's another bit of the spec we haven't looked at yet. 
the bottom part in particular. This 675 chip has got 5 or 6 pins, depends whether they use the master clear. But there's a limit, as you'll see there it says, don't try to get any more than uh, 25 milliamps out of any of the, of the, chip, of the pins of the chip. Any more than 25 milliamps from any pin is liable to damage that pin. It might, it might damage the whole chip, make it unusable. Or it might just blow that one bit of the pick. That can cause all kinds of problems, by the way, because the, your program seems to work, except that light never lights up. And you're convinced it's your program, and you keep rewriting the program, and the pin still never lights up. And you change the pick, and it suddenly works. Somewhere along the line, you've shorted that pin to, to uh, zero volts, say, and blown the output part of it. All the rest of the, the pick works happily, but that output stage has been blown. So never go above, that. and these are maximums, don't, don't try and push it. I'll try to get 26 milliamps, don't even try to get 25 milliamps. You know, but you can get um, a fair amount out of any one pin. If you need more than that, say for example to run a relay, when you saw they're on, you would take that output, put it through a transistor to handle the, the higher current. Or put it through um, a MOSFET or something. You know. Not only that, there's a limit to how much you can take out the whole chip. You'll see that at the bottom, 125 milliamps. Well, if you use five, five pins and they're all running at 25 milliamps, you'll get 125. If you try to use six pins all at 25 milliamps, you've exceeded the, the total and you'll like to damage the whole chip. So as long as you remember that when you're doing your design, you'll be safe. And it gets more complicated as you go on. This one's got 12 pins. This is a 676 chip. 12 pins, 12 times 25 milliamps is 300 milliamps. So it's even worse. Right? So you've got to be very careful on what dissipation you're going to allow from each pin. Now, you'll notice there uh, as a slight uh, difference that the, the, the 18313 can have a much higher current of 50 milliamps from any pin. But since you've got 12 pins potentially that's 12 times five, uh, 50 milliamps, which is 600 milliamps times, uh, say, 5 volts. You're way beyond your, your uh, dissipation. So you have to be very careful. You allow 50 in any one, but you can't have all 12 doing the 50. As long as this is when you're designing stuff. What I normally do with, with the, um, the workshops is I've got a board that's got all kinds of stuff on it, touch screens and, and uh, stepper motors and sounders and you name it there. And we can play with. Obviously we can't do that in this situation. But I'll just do a quick look at some of the things that we, we can do. Outputs. We can flash a LED. I put that there just to say, how simple is that? We've got a LED that will flash off and on, any speed you like. It could be half a second on, half a second off, it'd be half a second on, um, a minute off. It's only flash occasionally. So we can do that in the program, and we've only used the pick and three other components. Very low component count to get what we wanted. Very low component count. Because all the clever stuff is happening inside the pick. It's worth mentioning at this point about highs and lows. There's two ways you can connect an LED. The top one shows you taking it from the pin up to 5 volts. The other one shows you taking it from uh, that pin down to 0 volts. The reason I mention that is that you can give commands, let's say put the lead on or the lead off, which can be confusing. 
Because if we put that pin here high, which is what on says, it won't go on. There's five volts there and there's five volts there. It won't go on. That has to be low to go on. So I, I tend not to say things like off and on. I tend to say the lead goes high or the lead goes low rather than on and off. Because that, that can be confusing. Because in one situation, you're you're sourcing current, in our case, you're sinking current. Which is back to, you probably saw in that specification there, plus or minus 50 milliamps. You can have 50 milliamps coming out of the, the pin or going into the pin. There's basic traffic lights, just for one set of lights. If all you want is one set of lights in your layout, you only need three LEDs with a droppers. And it works. A very low component count again. 50 pence for the pick and pennies for the leads and resistors. Put in a bit of air board and for a powder or whatever, you've got yourself a, a single set of traffic lights. Very low component count. Once again, all the timings and the sequence are all inside the program. There's the, the, the welder kit. We managed to put on two LEDs. And the difference here is they managed to use pulse width modulation. So what happens is that the, the white lead flashes every so often and then the red starts to glow, comes up, the illumination comes up and when the flashing stops, that's meant to emulate the, the weld cooling down, you'll see it slowly darkening and going out. So this is used to do uh, pulse width modulation to get to change lead uh, lighting levels. The same thing happens with if you want to use the lighthouse kit. It, it's got a bright white light, just one bright white light, and it'll light up and and go up and dim and up and dim, which is meant to sort of emulate the the light going round. It's brighter to face you. It's duller comes back round, it's brighter again, and it, without having actual uh, movement up there, it gives you the impression of it. And we've got three links down the side, you can put wires in there or not, which gives us eight different options, so we can have different um, lighting patterns for different lighthouses. And that's using pulse width modulation to get that ramping effect of up lighting and dimming. There's the random lights kit. It's using a little trimmer there, and its job is to decide how quickly you want the lights to go off and on. The random's built in here already. It's even got the droppers. All you need to do is connect less to this kit. But that decides whether you want the lights to go off and on quite quickly or quite slowly. We tend to use it quite fast at, at uh, exhibitions so folk can see the effect but you probably use it in a more natural way on your own layout. Here's another simple one. These are in, I did this as an article in the journal some years ago about the pneumatic man. This is the, the, the Wiesemann driller. Costs about 30 quid. And the guy likes to drill by doing a sideways movement, which isn't at all uh, typical. So I thought there's a better way of doing it, and this is the version we've put on our own layout. So it goes up and down uh, rather than sideways, which is a, a bit more realistic. And all it is, is a really that we put a bit of wire on and the programs inside the pick and every so often it flicks the relay in a pattern and then that pulls this one up and down and that's attached to the wee guy and he goes up and down. So again, a very low component count and the pattern is all to do with the programming inside the chip itself. And by the way, heck of a lot cheaper than the the, the Wiesemann as well as being more realistic. Plus, the guy 
is standing on the job he's working on. He's not standing in a big plastic disc. So it's much more realistic. Right, quickly, inputs. We can have digital inputs. This is a very basic burglar alarm. You have a, somebody opens the door or, or stands on the pressure pad or whatever it is and the alarm goes off. An input here decides the output there. So that's a digital input. We also use the, this, I can show you this when working I think. We had a problem in our layout that we had a, a signal arm, semaphore arm, and there was no glass in the arm itself. So we put a, an LED in there in its place. And it's a bipolar, a bicolor LED. You know, so it depends which polarity you put on it, which way it lights up. The problem we had was that the servo itself was moving the arm up slowly, which was prototypical, but the, the light would change instantly. So it would go to green before it would get up. It would switch to red before it even come down. So we had to write a bit of code inside that pic that says, wait till it's fully down, then bring on the red. Wait till it's fully up, and then bring on the green. With a little bit of delay. And I can show that and I'll explain why I'm talking about it. Can you see there's a delay between the switching? So that does two things. It means, again, with hardly any component count, just a chip, pick chip and a lead, we get the effect we want. We get the delay, so it's more realistic. And what we're doing is we're using one pin, one minute to go high. If that goes high and that one goes low, it goes green. If, if you change that from low to high and that from high to low, it, it goes red. We're just, we're just switching the polarity between the two pins. We can do that, that's allowable. Where the time will move on. There's another, the uh, kit that does the automatic coach lighting. It's using the infrared detector that bounces a beam off the track and then reads the value. And look at the size of it put on a bit of bureau board. It's smaller than a postage stamp. And again, the component count is tiny, but it does a lot better than the commercial version, which costs a lot of money and is more prone to false uh, triggering. So that's us using an output one minute and an input the minute to read what comes back. And operating servers is a big thing about, about model railways nowadays. We use them for points, we use them for uh, semaphore arms, we use them for animations in the layout, doors opening, people walking about, all that kind of stuff. So it's very popular nowadays and servers are ideal for, for, uh, for doing that. There's the easy points kit. You plug in the servo at the left hand side here, the three pin servo, and then We've got three little trimmers. One decides how far the servo moves in one direction, and the other one decides how much it, what's in the other direction. What they call the end points. And over between the two of them, you get the arc that the servo is going to move. And then finally, you can control the speed that works at. You want it fast or slow. All those decisions are taking place inside the the pick chip. It's reading those three analog voltages in to decide what to do next. And then it waits for the switch to operate and opens the servo according to what you've just decided. Servo works on a timing basis. It depends on the pulses that come out of the, the uh, controller into the servo. If it's a one millisecond pulse, it's fully 
in that case, as you see there, anti-clockwise, if it's a two millisecond pulse, then you're looking at uh, fully clockwise, and anything in between will be different. If you put in 1.2 milliseconds, you'll get something in between those. If you put in 1.7, something in between those. So all we need to do is have our pick handle that. And I've got an example here. Here's one of the little modules I showed you earlier. Little test module. ICSP on that side. Pick servo output. These were very popular for people with model, model planes because you didn't want to put a servo into a plane and then discover it had glitches. It would only go so far and get jammed or it would be stuttery. So you test it that way first to make sure you get a nice smooth rotation. Otherwise a plane disappears over the horizon. So we'll have to use a uh, test it first. But look at that. That's probably the lowest component count you can get. The pick itself and a servo. There's no other parts to it. So we can do a lot just in the programming. It doesn't have to be lots of add-ons. We had crossing gates in our layout and what we discovered was and they both operate at the same time, they're hitting each other, halfway. So what we did was, we, we, we wrote the code to operate this one servo, and then waited a while, then operate the other servo, so that there was always a gap, they would never hit in the way going across. And again, that's already in use in our layout, uh, our demo layout, and what, three components. Analog examples. What I didn't show you earlier on, I showed you the, the pinouts for, in this case, the 675. There's the GPO, which means general purpose, but next to it it says ANO. That just means that if you want to, you can use that as an analog port. You can put in variable DC readings into it. That's what we use for the easy points using the little trimmers. We're feeding in. Uh, varying DC amounts in, and making um, sense of it. There it is in the newer 8313, there it is called ANA0. Here's an example, we can have a, a LED that flashes and we can control the LED not by keeping changing the program, not changing the code all the time, just put a, a little pot on it or a slider, and you can decide how fast it, uh, it flashes, just by changing the values of the part. Again, hardly any components. Well, there's one I was playing with. Let's see if I can show you that one. Uh, it's just op two, uh, two analog inputs and two pictures. Uh, two uh, servers, sorry. Let's have a look at that one. There we go. There's the board. There's the pot. You can do it in one axis. Or you can do it in the other axis. Yep. Does that make sense? Hmm. Yes. No problems with that. No, 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 no. So you probably remember that the, the gun that we showed a previous time that would, that would animate, elevate, and rotate. So I've got that using a joystick, or I can switch it on to here and do it just by up and down, left and right movements, depending on which. So I've got two options for controlling that in that particular example there. 
So that opens up all kind of possibilities for uh, animations. That's a gun. What what Neil had done with the gun was he put it in a box. I'll show you that underneath in a minute. But essentially, he's combined servos, and you'll see the flash and the sound. So r rather than pay the, the, the money for that larger plastic structure I showed you, which you can buy in, on eBay, he built it this way so it would be smaller. So you'll see there's one servo down here that does the rotation and there's one here with a bit of piano wire that elevates the gun up and down. And it controls a lead to flash the, the, the gun flash and it controls a sound player to make the noise all from the one, the one pick chip. Touch screens. I'm experimenting with that just now, not for a pick, I'm experimenting that just now for uh, Arduinos. It's the same principle. You can make a pick uh, respond to a touch screen. So let you get in your phone, whatever bit you touch, it'll, it'll know and take the appropriate action. You can control motors, we do that in our, um, one of our layouts that the pick itself feeds into a 293 deep which is a power uh, driver for a motor we've got that there that's the the um, barge that we have on back and forth we've got a motor a threaded rod we've got various sensors along the way so it knows where it is, it'll stop on one side, it'll stop in the middle, it'll stop on the left and up here, away at the left hand side, uh, your right hand side, you'll see the pick that controls it all You can control motors directly using pulse lift modulation straight into uh, a power driver like a, a TIP122 or whatever You can control motors directly from a pick again with a small uh, component count and there's one of the, the larger uh, pick chips that I used for back and forth. I've got lots of inputs coming in from track detectors. This is the early model where the, the kids could press a button to start the whole thing. The kids pressed the button, that was an input, and then it would, the locals would go back and forward, it would change points, all kind of stuff would happen, animations, doors would open, signals would work, crossing gates would work, points would switch, all kind of stuff. Lots of lots of activity, but it all boils down to well, there's not a lot there. I've got I've got a crystal in it. I've got that motor control chip off off scene, but all the the clever stuff is all happening inside here. Again, a low component count, but it's all to do with the programming. Yet we can control a whole myriad of different uh, types of device. And lastly, there's whole things I haven't even looked at. Heat sensors, infrared sensors, right? touch buttons. I've got various uh, little devices, you know, that, um, like touch pads, all that kind of thing. You can get little cheap touch buttons. All kind of uh, interface devices. We haven't looked at the tilt switches and pressure sensors, all that kind of stuff. There's a whole range of things that the picks are already involved in that we can uh, use to your home. One of the members has built a pick uh, controlled uh, automatic chicken coop, for example. Right? Or you can use it for adaptive for model railways. And that's just some of them. To that we can finally add in, there's even more, how about writing to LCDs, how about controlling turntables and traversers using steppers, how do we store values, you know, there's a whole myriad of things we can do once we know uh, how a pick chip can connect to the world and how to program it.